Hello, this video teaches a broad approach to examination of the ankle and foot. In clinical practice, however, a good history will help you to focus your physical examination. Remember that the ankle and foot are complex structures and pain can arise from any of the bones, joints or periarticular soft tissues, including the tendon sheaths, bursae and plantar fascia. Pain can also be referred from the spine and nerve roots or arise from peripheral nerves, thus requiring a neurological examination. In this video, I will focus on the ankle and foot only. For teaching purposes, I have structured the examination into inspection, palpation, range of movement, and special test. Let's look at some surface anatomy. The true ankle joint is a saddle-shaped joint made up of the tibia and fibula articulating with the talus below. The medial malleolus of the tibia and lateral malleolus of the fibula extend inferiorly to form an arch-like structure known as the ankle mortis. This provides stability and prevents rotation of the talus within it. The foot is composed of three units. The hind foot consists of the talus and the calcaneus below. The talus articulates with the tibia and fibula, forming the true ankle joint, which allows plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. The talus articulates with the calcaneus, forming the subtalar joint. This allows inversion and eversion of the hind foot. Let's look at the midfoot. This is composed of the navicular medially, the cuboid laterally, and the three cuneiforms in the distal row. The navicular is the prominence on the medial aspect of the foot. The forefoot is composed of the metatarsals and the phalanges of the toes. The prominence on the lateral aspect is the base of the fifth metatarsal. Next, we would look at some important ligaments. On the medial aspect, you would find the deltoid ligament. This is a band-like ligament that runs from the tip of the malleolus to the talus, navicular, and calcaneus. It consists of four parts, the anterior tibia talo, the tibia navicular, the tibia calcaneal, and the posterior tibia talo. On the lateral aspect, you would find the lateral ligaments. These consist of the anterior talofibular ligament, the calcaneofibular ligament, and the posterior talofibular ligament. Now, let's turn our attention to some important tendons. In the anterior or extensor compartment, you would come across the tibialis anterior. This is the most medial. And, is can, and can be brought out by dorsiflexion. The extensor hallucis longus is the next and extends the great toe. This is followed by the extensor digitorum longus, which supplies the other four toes and extends these toes. You would also find the peroneus tertius, which runs to the base of the fifth metatarsal and assists with dorsiflexion. The dorsalis pedis artery runs between the EHL and the EDL and can be palpated as a pulsation on the dorsal aspect of the foot. We would now look at the lateral or peroneal compartment. This runs behind and inferior to the medial malleolus and is responsible for eversion. Here you would find the peroneus longus and anterior to that, the peroneus brevis, which attaches to the base of the fifth metatarsal. We will now turn to the medial flexor compartment. Most anteriorly, you can find the tibialis posterior tendon, followed by the flexor digitorum longus, which flexes the toes, and the flexor hallucis longus, 
which flexes the great toe. These are held down by a flexor retinaculum running from the medial malleolus and forming the roof of the tarsal tunnel. The posterior tibial artery can also be found in this area and can be felt as a pulsation on the posterior aspect of the medial malleolus. In the posterior compartment, you will find the Achilles tendon. This is the common tendon of the gastrocnemius and soleus muscles. It inserts into the posterior surface of the calcaneum and is responsible for plantar flexion of the foot. All of the preceding tendons, except the Achilles, are invested in tenosynovial sheets as they cross the joint. I have not demonstrated these. There are also some important bursae around the foot and ankle which can become inflamed causing bursitis with localized swelling and pain. The retroachilial bursa, which is demonstrated here in purple, lies over the Achilles under the skin and can be irritated by the rim of tight-fitting shoes. The retrocalcaneal bursa, demonstrated again in purple, lies between the calcaneum and the Achilles. This can produce swelling and tenderness on either aspect of the Achilles tendon. The subcalcaneal bursa lies under the calcaneum and can present with heel pain and swelling. You can also find bursae over the malleoli, such as this one, the lateral malleolar bursa over the lateral malleolus, and a similar one over the medial malleolus. Another important structure is the plantar fascia, demonstrated here in green. This inserts into the medial calcaneal tuberosity. Tenderness in this area can be found in plantar fasciitis. Before finishing off surface anatomy, we would quickly look at the arches of the foot. We usually think of two main arches, but there are actually four. The medial longitudinal arch, the lateral longitudinal arch, the anterior or transverse, metatarsal arch and the transverse mid-tarsal arch. As an initial part of inspection, always do a gait assessment if possible. Look for pain or limping and the point at which it occurs. Observe the stance phase from heel strike to mid-stance to toe off. If pain is coming from a particular leg, the patient will shorten the time spent on that leg and the stance phase is therefore shorter. Look at the swing phase. Does a foot clear the ground? Is there a foot drop? Ask the patient to walk on the toes. This is a test of plantar flexion strength. Then the heels. This tests dorsiflexion strength. You can also have the patient walk on the lateral border of the feet. This will test inversion strength. And then the medial border of the feet. This will test eversion strength. Remember to inspect the patient's shoes or footwear. Inspect for asymmetric or abnormal wearing patterns. Most people wear out the central or outer corner of the heel. Wearing of the medial forefoot can occur in overpronators, whereas wearing of the lateral forefoot would occur in oversupinators. Wearing of the medial aspect of the heel will occur in persons with severe pronation of the foot. The ankle and foot should be inspected in weight bearing and at rest. You can begin inspection with the patient standing looking from the front, the side, and the back. Take note of any spinal deformity or any hip or knee misalignment, as these can all affect the feet. These are described in the respective videos. From the front, look for adduction deformities of the forefoot, which are towards the midline, and abduction deformities, which are away from the midline. Look for splaying of the toes. 
This occurs with collapse of the transverse metatarsal arch and can occur with degeneration or inflammatory arthritis. Hallux valgus is lateral deviation of the gray toe more than the usual 10 to 15 degrees. It is often associated with a painful callus or bursa overlying the MTP head. This is known as a bunion. A similar process can occur at the fifth MTP and give rise to a bunionette or Taylor's bunion. Look for collapse of the longitudinal arch which results in flat foot or pes planus. The apex should be at least one centimeter above the ground and you should be able to slip your fingers under. A high arch is seen in pes cavus. The hind foot is normally in about five to 10 degrees of valgus compared to the calf. Excessive hind foot valgus can be seen with pes planus or overpronation of the foot. Looking from behind, normally only one or two toes can be seen on the lateral side. If more than this is seen, it is called a too many toes sign. This can be due to severe pes planus where the calcaneus is in valgus and the forefoot is abducted. If the sign is only seen unilaterally, this can be due to rupture or dysfunction of the tibialis posterior which normally supports the medial longitudinal arch. This can be tested by the heel rise test. Normally, the arch will be restored and the heel will go into inversion. Continuing with inspection, look for swelling and erythema. True ankle joint swelling would cause loss of the normal depressions anterior to the malleoli. Tenosynovitis will give localized swelling around the affected tendon. For example, fullness posterior to the medial malleolus can be found in posterior tibial tenosynovitis. Swelling anterior to the Achilles can be seen in retrocalcaneal bursitis. On the other hand, swelling overlying the Achilles can be found with retroachilial bursitis. Swelling on the dorsal aspect of the foot can be found with arthritis affecting the intertarsal joints, whereas swelling of the forefoot may indicate inflammatory arthritis affecting the MTP joints, such as in rheumatoid arthritis. Look for toe deformities, such as hammer toes, claw toes, and mallet toes. Also, take note of any skin and nail changes, such as psoriasis or nodules. And do not forget to check the sole. Look for dropped metatarsal heads. These are often associated with calluses overlying them. On palpation, check the joints for warmth. You should palpate all of the bony and soft tissue structures for tenderness in a systematic fashion. For example, you can start laterally, working your way down the fibula to the lateral malleolus, the lateral malleolar bursa, the lateral ligaments, and the peroneal tendons, down to the base of the fifth metatarsal. Anteriorly, work your way down the shin, across the extensor tendons, the tarsal bones, and each of the metatarsal bones. Medially, again, you can work your way down the tibia, the medial malleolus, the medial malleolar bursa, the deltoid ligament, and the posterior tibialis and flexor tendons. Posteriorly, you can feel the calf, the muscular tendinous junction, and the Achilles tendon for tenderness. Palpate the Achilles insertion on the calcaneus. Tenderness here may indicate enthesitis. You can also palpate the subcalcaneal bursa. For plantar fasciitis, apply pressure to the plantar fascia insertion. In plantar fasciitis, this should elicit pain. 
You can also stress the plantar fascia by dorsiflexing the toes. In painful heel pad syndrome, the center of the heel is painful. For true ankle joint swelling, cup your hands around the ankle and using your thumbs, palpate the joint space between the malleoli and the talus, feeling for fullness or bogginess. You can also try to blot fluid with your thumbs with enough pressure to blanch your nail bed and pushing with one thumb and then the other. Tenderness of the MTP joints can be assessed by the MTP squeeze or metatarsal compression test. For MTP joint swelling, we use a four-finger technique similar to the MCP examination in the hand video. Remember that the MTP joint space is actually about one to two centimeters proximal to the web space. Supporting the joint with your middle finger Palpate the joint with the tips of your thumbs. Roll the tips of your thumbs in and out of the joint space, feeling for tenderness, synovial thickening, and effusions. And try blotting fluid back and forth. The MTP joints are notoriously difficult to assess so an ultrasound may be needed if there is uncertainty. Palpate the PIP and DIP joints of the toes. This is also done using a four-finger technique as demonstrated in the hand video. Try blotting fluid back and forth and check for tenderness, synovial thickening and effusions. I would finish off by palpation for a Morton's neuroma. This is more often due to entrapment of an interdigital nerve rather than a true neuroma and often occurs between the second and third or third and fourth toes. It presents with lancinating pain in the affected cleft and adjacent toes. The pain is made worse by compressing the metatarsal heads together while squeezing the affected web space. A soft tissue mass may be palpable. Range of movement can be assessed with a combination of active and passive movement. This should be done with a knee flexed. Neutral position is with the foot at 90 degrees. Ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion occur at the true ankle joint or tibiotalar joint. Normal ankle dorsiflexion is 15 to 25 degrees and normal plantar flexion is 40 to 50 degrees. Movement at the subtalar joint produces eversion and inversion. To do this, stabilize the leg with one hand and cup the heel with the other. Inversion is up to 30 degrees and eversion is up to 20 degrees. To test the mid-tarsal joint, stabilize the talus and calcaneus by cupping the heel, then grasp the midfoot and forefoot. Inversion is up to 30 degrees and eversion is up to 20 degrees. You can also assess adduction and abduction. As a screen, you can ask the patient to extend all of the toes to check extension and then curl all of the toes to check flexion. The first MTP joint allows 70 to 90 degrees of dorsiflexion and 35 to 50 degrees of plantar flexion. The second to fifth toes can be assessed passively if needed. The MTP joint allows 40 degrees of plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. The PIP joints allow 50 degrees of plantar flexion. And the DIP joint allows 10 to 30 degrees of dorsiflexion and 40 to 50 degrees of plantar flexion. You can do this for all of the toes as needed. 
we would first perform some ligament stability testing. The deltoid ligament can be tested by grasping the leg and stabilizing, then holding the hind foot and applying an eversion force. Check for excessive movement or pain and compare with the other side. The lateral ligaments can be tested by stabilizing the leg once again, grasping the hind foot and applying an inversion force, again checking for excessive laxity or pain. Remember to compare with the other side once again. The anterior draw test checks for tears of the anterior talofibular ligament. This can occur with inversion injuries of the ankle. With the foot in about 20 degrees of plantar flexion, stabilize the leg, then support and grasp the foot by the heel and pull forward. Forward movement of the talus on the tibia especially more than 5 mm compared to the other side, is a positive anterior draw sign. We would now move on to the tunnels test. This assesses for tarsal tunnel syndrome, which is caused by impingement of the posterior tibial nerve as it traverses the tunnel. Patients would complain of paresthesias radiating to the great toe and sometimes the first three toes. This is done by percussing over the tarsal tunnel to see if it reproduces the patient's symptoms. The last special test is the Thompson calf squeeze test. This is done to assess for complete rupture of the Achilles tendon. If the Achilles is ruptured, a gap should be noted along the tendon. The test is done with the patient kneeling or lying. With an intact tendon, passive squeezing of the calf muscles produces plantar flexion of the foot, as you can see here. If this does not happen, it is a positive test for Achilles tendon rupture. Thanks for watching. I truly hope this was useful to you. Please be sure to subscribe. There are lots of other videos, including other physical exams and injection techniques. Thanks and bye for now.